So welcome to Microservices Track. Uh, so we have, uh, I think, three uh, talks lined up in this track. And in this talk, I'm going to focus on uh, microservices for enterprises. Actually, change the uh, title a bit because uh, because what we have seen so far is uh, that most of the customers and most of the users who are adopting microservices are struggling to adopt, mainly because uh, because uh, of the, some of the things that we that they already have in the enterprise are not really compatible with microservices architecture. So in this session, I'm going to talk about some of the patterns, best practices, challenges, and how WSO2 is addressing some of the key areas, uh, key challenges that you face when you are adapting microservices in your enterprise. <laughs> All right, so let's get started with uh, the current uh, enterprise architecture with, uh, you know, if you look at any of, most of your uh, existing architectures, you will have uh, uh, some set of like system of records like data, files, or any other, uh, uh, systems, and on top of that, you'll have uh, have an application layer where you have uh, multiple coarse grain services, uh, uh, which are deployed uh, inside a monolithic application server, right? And these services are uh, those are not directly exposed to the consumers. Rather, you create different compositions out of these services, and those compositions are done inside the ESP. And uh, when it comes to exposing those compositions, again, you use API management layer as a facade. And all the API management concepts, such as uh, versioning, throttling, monetization, were applied at that layer. And consumers basically start consuming APIs. So this is the tr uh, traditional uh, enterprise architecture with uh, so a, uh, ESP and APIs. So when we are moving into microservices architecture, the foundation of uh, microservice, the foundation concepts of microservices architecture is to uh, developing a single application as a set of fine-grained uh, independent services, right? So these services are uh, designed, developed, deployed and managed independently. So that is the key concept behind uh, a microservice. So if we try to apply these concepts into the, uh, the previous uh, architecture diagram, we can basically uh, get rid of uh, the centralized application layer part as well as the uh, ESP layer, the central integration layer, and we create a set of fine-grained microservices, right? And again, you expose that layer through uh, an API management layer. Okay, so so the the things that we are discussing in this uh, session is the key challenges that you are facing when you are doing uh, this kind of a architectural change. All right, so I would like to get started with the uh, designing phase of microservices. So one of the key, uh, th there are several misconceptions when it comes to designing services. Uh, one is the, uh, you should have, you should create microservices so that you have a very limited set of lines of code, as well as the team size. And the word micro itself is a very misleading term. So rather focusing on things like uh, lines of code, uh, you should focus more on the uh, business aspect of your service. Uh, a given microservice should have a, uh, the single responsibility principle. It should have a limited and a focused uh, business requirement uh, along with the boundary, business boundary defined for that service. So what this really means is, uh, so when you are trying to use this in practice, what uh, what actually analysts like Gartner uh, has observed was uh, microservices as it is, like a too fine-grained service is not a practical approach, right? So rather they define a new, new term, like a mini-service, that is uh, a coarse-grained service with uh, like uh, 
set of uh, fun business functionalities, few set of operations, but that is independently uh, developed and deployed. So uh, what they are saying is uh, using a mini service is more pragmatic than a very fine grained service. So when you are designing services, you can uh, clearly identify a specific business requirement and you can create a, a mini service uh, based on that requirement. So that is, uh, can be considered as a best practice. All right, so then I would like to move into the communication technologies related to microservices. So uh, as you know, most of the communications uh, or the messaging between uh, web services being done through SOAP uh, and all the uh, WSTAR uh, with the use of WSTAR standards and uh, with microservices architecture, we foster the use of simple and lightweight messaging uh, mechanisms, right? So in that context, uh, as you know, REST is getting really popular alongside HTTP and uh, service definition technologies like uh, Open API or Swagger is also becoming popular and JSON is used as the main data type in uh, synchronous messaging of uh, microservices. Okay. So the other aspect of uh, synchronous messaging, uh, Google or uh, gRPC is getting really popular uh, because we have been like closely working with most of the tech community and most of the organizations are now uh, migrating their internal microservices to gRPC. So they actually had most of their services built using HTTP and REST. And now they are migrating all their internal services in particular to gRPC. So the key aspect of gRPC is to have a, like a, so it runs on top of HTTP. So which is a, uh, one main reason behind the success of gRPC. So it is purely based on the uh, interface definition language based on uh, protobuf. So you basically define the service using protobuf and you generate code based on your preferred language. <coughs> so once you are done with the code, uh, code gen, you can simply create a service without worrying about the underlying data formats like JSON or XML. You just, uh, it's quite easier to build a uh, gRPC based service and quite uh, performing really better, much better than most of the other REST services. Also other styles like Avro, Thrift also becoming popular. Uh, <coughs> so the other aspect of, uh, now we discuss about synchronous messaging. Uh, asynchronous messaging techniques also becoming more popular. Uh, so there are things like uh, single receiver based communication. Also this is more like uh, queue based communication. Uh, the message is basically acting as a command to the other microservice. And also you can use PubSub messaging. So in this context, again, uh, uh, AMQP also becoming very important because of uh, language agnostic nature. Kafka is also, as you know, it's quite popular as well as uh, MQTT. So synchronous versus uh, asynchronous messaging. So the a key aspect of synchronous messaging is that uh, when you have uh, a chain of services, so you have one service calling uh, multiple downstream services, there are quite a few issues like uh, this service is purely dependent on all the other downstream services. So that kind of, uh, that concept kind of violates the microservices autonomy, right? So microservices is meant to be an independent service, but uh, this particular service is dependent on all the other service. And also if there is a latency uh, that will be propagated all the way down, say that this service is slow and it affects the behavior or the SLA of all the other uh, upstream services. So, uh, so as a best practice, you can, we can consider that having a synchronous communication between services is much better than a synchronous communication. Okay. 
So, uh, the other aspect of uh, uh, microservices uh, types is that not all microservices are similar. Right? Some microservices are having a lot of business logic and some are uh, obviously asynchronous and some are communicating in uh, synchronous fashion as well as some services has not has a lot of uh, external service or network calls. And, uh, and also most of the microservices cannot be directly exposed as a business service. For example, say that you are building some business functionality for your customers. So it's very unlikely that you will expose a, a microservice that you develop directly as a business functionality. You might have to have some kind of a composition between multiple systems and service and create and finally expose as a composite API to the consumers. So uh, how to build composite or integration microservices. We discussed this concept uh, quite a few times during the conference, but uh, you can, uh, what most of the uh, microservices uh, implementation uh, has done was they use general purpose languages like uh, Java, Node, Groovy, and especially the frameworks like Spring Boot for building compositions. Uh, but uh, as you know, these frameworks or languages are not really designed for doing this kind of composition. As Sanjeeva mentioned in the morning, uh, these languages uh, do not have uh, sufficient abstractions to make network communication simpler. And of, of course, we have seen, actually I've been talking to multiple customers who are using microservices. So they build microservices layer using Spring Boot, uh, type of technologies, but when it comes to integration, they use an ESP. Right? The main reason was Spring Boot and the other technologies are not powerful enough to build that kind of uh, uh, compos composite or integration services. So they, end they ended up using ESP, uh, which is okay, like which is not really aligned with the microservices architectural principles, but since you don't have an option, you can uh, stick to that. But uh, Obviously, tra using traditional ESP approach is not the best thing that you can do. So that's where we built uh, this Ballerina programming language to build uh, uh, a technology to build uh, or the composite or integration microservices. So, so basically, if you look at uh, different aspect of uh, how to organize microservices, you can see there are business logic heavy services or core microservices. And on top of that, you have compositions, uh, composite or integration services. And then you have API services, which are centrally managed. Uh, all the throttling, versioning, monetizations are applied centrally. But these are like micro gateways, but they are managed centrally. And that from the W2 stack, you can use uh, uh, Ballerina, obviously, for using building integration services, API services, and uh, API manager. The current version of the API manager can be used as the, uh, I would say, central API gateway. But when you have the API manager 3 version coming out, it can be used as the <coughs> micro gateway. <coughs> so integration layer, again, Ballerina fits into the picture. For building core services, we have uh, microservices framework for Java. So we will we'll have talks on MS4J as well as Ballerina compositions uh, on upcoming sessions. So uh, one would say that layered architecture is not the best approach for building microservices. So, some, uh, so they can use the graph style communication between microservices. So in this context, again, you have uh, services that has, uh, that have a lot of network calls or services that uh, have a lot of business logic. Again, you can pick and choose what, whatever the technology that you are going to use. Again, MS4J and Ballerina. OK. So moving into microservices security. So this is another uh, important topic. Uh, uh, so when it comes to securing microservices, there are, uh, this is one of the standard patterns that you can use. Basically, uh, your consumers are 
microservice has been uh, secured uh, with the use of an API gateway. So the mobile client or whatever the consumers uh, who's consuming these APIs, they are actually sending access tokens, uh, so uh, auth-based security. And they, uh, the authorization server translate that access token to a JWT, and that contains all the user information and all the uh, claims, etc. And JWT is propagated all the way down to microservices. And microservices level, you have the JWT processing so that you can identify various user attributes at this layer. So this is a very common uh, security pattern for microservices. And I would recommend to read uh, uh, this blog by our director of security architecture, Prabhat. He has several other security patterns listed uh, in this blog. Okay, so microservices deployment, probably the most important aspect of uh, microservices architecture. Uh, there's nothing new in this slide, but uh, the main idea is you build and deploy microservices independently, and Docker and Kubernetes is kind of becoming de facto standards when it comes to deployment and uh, scaling. So I guess uh, Kubernetes is uh, winning over all the other competition uh, as per the feedback that we got from the community. Yeah. Uh, do you think you, we need one microservices per Docker or, or multiple microservices per Docker? Yeah, uh, actually it's a good question. So uh, you can, uh, that actually depends on what type of service. So I would say, uh, let's say you have a, a search service, a checkout service and accounting service. Maybe you can have accounting and uh, checkout service in the same uh, container, like uh, same uh, image, same container, and uh, you can have a independent scaling for the uh, service that that's that's getting more traffic. So based on the business requirement, I think you can pick and choose the deployment pattern. Can we ask another question? Yeah. and lifecycle management of these other really important protocols if you need to perform and, and have a also asynchronous based uh, mostly maybe internal uh, microservice model which yeah. you know discovery mechanisms office mechanisms contract mechanisms you suggest yeah so actually i'll answer that question uh, on some of the upcoming slides uh, if you don't mind yeah so Again, uh, this is another common pattern that uh, actually Microsoft has this, uh, defined this pattern, I guess. But anyway, the main uh, idea behind anti-corruption layer pattern is to have a, now you have a, uh, in, a, in your enterprise, you have a monolithic part as well as your new project, which is like a microservice based project, right? And monolithic part, you can consider something like a ERP system, which you cannot easily convert into microservices. So, uh, you, you can have an anti-corruption layer uh, between the micro and monolithic part and basically what this layer is doing is kind of providing a service interface uh, to your microservices layer. Uh, so this is, uh, I would say there's nothing new in it but you can use technologies like uh, Enterprise Integrator or any other ESB or even Ballerina can be used as the uh, anti-corruption layer to build the bridging between the micro and monolithic parts. So you need to have all the legacy or all the proprietary B2B connectors to do that. Uh, so regarding this, pretty much the similar uh, requirement, uh, strangler pattern. Uh, so when you, again, when you have some portion of your enterprise uh, running on a monolithic uh, architecture or I would say a, 
uh, a legacy system is running uh, on one part of your project and you can start with a small portion of your project with a new technology like a microservices architecture or let's say ballerina and EI6 for example. So then you can uh, at the early stages you can uh, have one very small portion of your project running, running on a new technology and gradually move that into uh, full migration into the modern, so which is a, another commonly used pattern. <coughs> okay, so moving on to data management, again, uh, microservices should have uh, uh, should have its own database, right? And there should be no uh, connection between like. Uh, uh, microservices cannot access the database of uh, some other microservices directly, rather it should go through the API. And uh, when it comes to creating joins, right, you have to create like database level joins. Uh, it is recommended to, to have a composite service that creates the composition rather than doing the joins at the database level. So again, when it comes to building these composite services, Ballerina has its own uh, data integration capabilities, uh, data tables, uh, all the data SQL related connectors, which will make your life easier. And between these databases, again, you can implement eventual consistency with the use of uh, asynchronous communication technologies. Okay, coming back to the uh, governance aspect, uh, in my opinion, governance has been really narrowed down to the uh, design, uh, design development and execution uh, phase of microservices, just saying that you should have decentralized governance for selecting the technology uh, or the frameworks that you have. Uh, but uh, governance is more than that in my opinion. So if you look at uh, when it comes to selecting, when it comes to uh, service design, deployment and execution, you are free to select, your teams are free to select whatever the technology that they want, and, but there are some global standards uh, that are applied across the organization. So that is the decentralized governance aspect, but uh, governance has several other things, right? most of the things that are coming from SOA governance. So the service registry is also part of the governance. Uh, what we have seen uh, with most of the microservices implementations is that uh, you have a central service registry, like uh, I think this is from Netflix. They have Eureka as the central uh, governance uh, registry where they have all the service definitions, uh, service URLs, etc. And uh, also, the other commonly used uh, service register implementations like console, etcd. So basically, this registry is acting as a repository for all the service metadata. The other aspect of governance is service dependencies. Uh, so in the SOA governance world, you more or less create these dependencies uh, during design time. Uh, but in microservices, given that the number of services, uh, it's better to deduce or derive these uh, dependencies during the runtime by basically looking at the communication style between services. So uh, a similar uh, implementation, uh, Netflix has this Viserial, uh, which is uh, uh, which is actually. Uh, basically looking at the messaging between microservices and it uh, create this kind of graphical representation. So these are again becoming really important uh, when it comes to uh, microservices governance. And also things like uh, uh, especially the runtime policy enforcement and identity and access management. These things are mostly applied at API gateway level at the moment. Uh, and also they are uh, also very important to have uh, some kind of throttling caching mechanisms, mechanisms for the microservices. Uh, I would say the current uh, options that you have is to apply that at the gateway layer. Also observability uh, is also part of the governance. So that means all the metrics, monitoring, uh, distributed tracing and logging. Uh, 
uh, uh, and also the visualization is part of your governance uh, solution. So there are like uh, few, quite a few options like Sipkin, uh, Prometheus, Grafana, and also analytics server can be used for this purpose. Actually, we are trying to address most of the things that we discuss as part of the governance as uh, in our upcoming products, uh, uh, like surveillance-based governance solution. So uh, you can expect more features on that product pretty soon. Okay, finally, I would like to uh, discuss a bit about this service mesh concept, uh, which is uh, which is quite getting quite popular nowadays. But uh, the main uh, motivation behind that is. Uh, so there's a saying like the most complex challenge in microservices architecture is not a it's not about building microservices but the but building the communication between the services. So uh, if you look at uh, most of the microservice implementations, uh, when you have to do multiple service calls, uh, you'll end up implementing most of the uh, network communication logic at these microservices layer, right? So uh, for example, things that we discuss in the morning like resiliency, timeout, circuit breaking, uh, you have to implement it from scratch. You may be using some external library like Hystrix, but still you have to implement in your services code. And when you, since you are uh, free to choose different technologies, for Java you can use Hyst Hystrix, Node.js you need to find another library, for Python you need to find another library. So. To avoid that problem, uh, so if you look at the inter-service communication between microservices, we can identify a given microservices has the business logic as well as the network communication <coughs> logic. So the idea of introducing service mesh is to uh, offload the network communication to a, a service mesh sidecar, which is running alongside the microservice. So for each microservices, microservice that you are building, you are running a sidecar proxy. So the, uh, so the microservice that you are develop, developing can focus on the business logic. And when it comes to communication, it only communicates with the sidecar proxy. And sidecar can take care of all the things like circuit breaking, timeouts, uh, discovery of the services. Uh, as well as different uh, types of like monitoring, applying various security policies, etc. So basically, uh, the key idea here is to offload all the network communication and only focus on business logic. So, uh, so if we apply the service mesh concept alongside the API gateways, uh, you can see there are multiple services that are running with its own sidecar. And API gateway may have things like resilient communication, or it can also use service mesh. So there are a couple of implementations like uh, Istio, uh, several organizations behind this, Google, IBM, et cetera. And Linkerd is another uh, service mesh implementation. So if we compare service mesh versus Ballerina, I guess, uh, in my opinion, the main reason for behind service mesh is that uh, most of the general purpose languages or Spring Boot or other similar technologies don't have enough network uh, communication abstractions. It's not easier to write network applications using those language. But it, with Ballerina, I don't see uh, much use of using service mesh because it has its own uh, uh, limitations, right? You are, you'll be running one sidecar proxy per each and every service that you are building. And also, this will drastically complicate the communication as well. So uh, in my opinion, when you have a technology like Ballerina in place, like when you are building services with Ballerina, it has all the resilient communication, service discovery, uh, monitoring, like running agents to publish uh, tracing messages to a central monitoring tool. So all the things are part of the language. So uh, maybe it's up for the discussion, but uh, you may have to reconsider using service mesh when you have a like a language like Ballerina. Okay, so with that, I would like to conclude the session. Uh, so I put some references uh, as well. So the 
the main things that we discussed uh, so far in the session was use a pragmatic approach to build a microservices architecture. And it's important to select the right pattern which matches your requirement. For example, uh, uh, if you have built your application layer as set of microservices and if you don't have a way to integrate, you can stick to the existing ESP and still gradually select the proper technology to build whatever the uh, component that you have in microservices architecture. Okay, so with that I would like to, I put some references. Uh, thank you very much. I can take a couple of questions, I guess. Yeah. Uh, why would you, you not choose Ballerina to build a core for microservices? Uh, so Ballerina has, uh, you know, as we mentioned in the morning, each programming has its own space, right? Like uh, specialized space. You can, uh, Ballerina is created mainly for network related communication, but at the same time you can do a lot of uh, computation as well, like arrays and all the other generic programming concept. But uh, when you when you are building a service, you have to often deal with a lot of uh, libraries. Like if you have, if you are using a lot of Java libraries, then I would say Spring Boot is better option to building core microservices than Ballerina. So likewise, based on your uh, libraries that you are using and underlying business adapters that you are using, you can choose the, the technology. Yeah, often transaction management is done with the use of compensation and rollbacks. So when you have multiple services, uh, if you want to roll back the transaction, you need to call the appropriate uh, operations in each and every microservices to roll back that transaction. So that's what actually Sanjeev mentioned in the morning. So this is the manual process at the moment, but at least for Ballerina services, we are trying to make it seamless so that you can start and end transaction and Ballerina runtime will take care of basically uh, executing all the compensation operations uh, on behalf of you. Yeah, but what if the core service is not written in Ballerina, then, then it's not able to roll back that, it cannot be part of the same transaction, right? Yeah, yeah. So that is a fundamental issue because like, so then you will need, uh, like, you, you, you would have known about like WSAT, right? Atomic transaction used to be a spec for like SOAP services. So you need some sort of standard in order to deal with such systems. So Ballerina to Ballerina, yes, we can invent our own uh, transaction protocol. But uh, when it comes to like other systems, I think it that might be an issue because uh, either over the years some standard might develop or uh, most probably that's the direction in which uh, we are going to move in because uh, that's, this is a fundamental question that uh, everybody raises. Right, when you have multiple systems uh, which are different to each other, how do you sort of roll back the transaction throughout uh, the entire uh, flow? So you need some sort of standards to do that. Yeah, because I mean, you talked about earlier that you have a sort of XA transaction con concept. Uh, also, yes. And if you're writing your core services in another language, then it's not yeah. because uh -huh. all the database access will be in the core services. Oh, yeah. That is a fundamental problem that uh, we will have to uh, solve through some sort of standards. Okay, so with that, we'll conclude the session. Thanks a lot.